Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidents. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Rob and I are back at it for our weekly chat about geopolitics and markets. As you can hear in my voice, I'm a little bit under the weather, but nothing stops us from podcasting, so I hope you enjoy. As always, if you want to talk to me about our wealth management services or about our research and consulting services, you can email me at jacob at cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also email me there for any thoughts you have in your mind, books you think I should read, or if you have um, any suggestions about how to get rid of a cold quickly, I'll accept those recommendations as well. Otherwise, cheers and see you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. Rob, I can't actually remember the last time you and I got to do our weekly chat on Thursday. It's, it feels like it's been your vacation and my vacation and this happened and that happened. It, it's, it feels like it's been a month. Has it been a month? It probably has. It's good to see you. It's been a long time. I hope uh, we don't forget how to do it. Oh, no. It's like riding a bike. Although, you know, I, I, I spent time with a friend of mine uh, who recently, and he he might listen to this, he might not. He knows who it is. He doesn't know how to ride a bike. Do you know anybody in your world who's like 35 plus years old and doesn't know how to ride a bike? No, I don't think I do. That's very strange. Uh, why don't we dive in and talk a little bit? We're going to talk about Europe and China today. Uh, why don't we start with Europe? Because I feel like we always talk about China and everybody talks about China and we will get to them in due course. They're the second largest economy in the world. Um, but you can sort of, if you pay any attention to geopolitics and to markets, you can tell that everybody is suddenly very pessimistic about Europe again. And there's some reason for that. Um, you know, some of the latest data out of the European economy is really bad. Uh, business activity contracted again in August to its lowest since November 2020, um, which is pretty scary. Um, German industrial production um, declined 0.8% last month. That's a third consecutive month of declines in Germany and, and German industrial production, and they are the beating economic heart of the European Union. Um, there's also, you know, we've talked about energy prices and why last year there was hysteria about energy prices going to the moon. This year there seems to be too much complacency, so we also are sort of telegraphing that we have some concern about energy in general. Um, and I haven't even mentioned Olaf Scholz falling down and wearing an eye patch as he gives un underwhelming speeches to the rest of the world. Um, but where, where do you want to start, Rob, in sort of taking apart and understanding what's happening in Europe and how folks should be understanding this? Oh, let's start with the eye patch for sure. <laughs> um, what do you what do you want to say about Germany in particular? Do you want to kind of set the stage because there's there's been some political developments that I think are worth talking about against the background of the sort of sputtering industrial economy there. Which ones in particular are you talking about? Oh, just uh, Scholz's sort of weakening weakening prestige, um, signs of his coalition losing popularity, signs of just them just not knowing what they want. Um, yeah. I mean, he, he never had much prestige to begin with. Um, I, I think we were like still beta testing the knowledge platform when Germany had its elections last year around this time. And, and one of the first sort of longer pieces that I put on, I don't even know if we formatted it in the nice, pretty and focus format that we have right now was thinking about Germany's elections and what the transition meant to go away from Angela Merkel, not just Angela Merkel, but the CSU into somebody like Olaf Scholz and the SPD. Um, but, you know, the SPD also is governing as part of a coalition. And it's a coalition that has never made much sense because you've got SPD, but then you've got the Greens on one side, and I'm forgetting the exact name of the other ones on the other side, but they're more sort of fiscal hawks. They don't want to spend a bunch of money. They don't like debt. You might as well throw them in with the frugals and the rest of the European Union. And um, it's, it's useful to go back and look at some of the things you wrote six to eight months ago, it turns out, because we said this is going to be a very fragile government. This government is going to try to make goals, and it probably won't be able to figure them out because Scholz is not going to be able to satisfy all of his coalition partners, and he doesn't have – 
the gravitas of Angela Merkel, who, even when she was pushing policies that maybe were controversial, say, about migration, was a great example, just by virtue of the fact of who she was and how long she had governed and her political skills, she could get stuff through. So I don't know that it's a development, but it is like we're now going on, you know, quite a while of Scholz being at the helm and the the fabric of that German government is coming apart at the seams. And you can see that in polls. If Germany had elections tomorrow, you'd probably have a radically different German government and probably you'd have a CSU, CDU thing. And, um, you know, the, the dreaded AFD alternative for Deutschland is also sort of lurking in the back. So now we get all these stories in the media. They just recycle the same stories they do every time AFD gets above 20%. Oh my God, the far right coming back in Germany. Let's all... Let's all make sure that Germany spends more than 2% of their budget on military GDP. Um, anyway, so that, that's like the political backdrop for what we're talking about here. One area that I find interesting, and in, in part because we're preparing a long-form uh, creative disruption piece on this, Tomas and I, is just this notion of sort of a backlash against um, green or environmental policies. So I know this has been a big thing in the Netherlands. Um, uh, in the last few weeks, the um, uh, what used to be the National Front in France, but is now called the, uh, I forget the name, Rassemblement National or something. They changed it. Um, they announced that their new big push is going to be anti-environmentalism and basically really trying to turn the screws on the fact that ordinary people feel like um, sort of green policies are crimping their way of life, crimping, uh, you know, um, the efficiency of, of the way things work and, and that sort of thing. And um, the the area that Tomas and I are, are working on for this piece is actually on these PFAS chemicals, these forever chemicals. Mm -hmm. And without giving too much away, because there's a lot of detail in the report and it talks about very specific areas where this is going to be a major problem, like, I hate to say it, but I can sort of sympathize with this because this PFAS ban, everyone is talking about this in, in, there's two stories in the media. The first is, oh, the chemical companies that make these forever chemicals, they're being hit with very big fines. So 3M, I think, had to pay a multi-billion dollar fine. I think people are aware of this. And for people who haven't been following this, these forever chemicals are basically uh, chemicals that are getting into the drinking water. It's a it's a serious and major health problem. It's not a made up thing. Um, but the angle that Tomas and I are exploring is well, you need these PFAS chemicals to do all sorts of like very fundamental industrial processes, um, paper making, for instance. If you want to make chlorine, you need this. There's no real other way to make chlorine, for example. Um, and again, without giving too much away, it's, it's, it's going to be a major bottleneck for a lot of things. And I just wonder, um, if you have any thoughts about kind of how, how greenery is, is rising or falling, if that's, if that's a theme that we should be thinking about, um, cause I've had my head in this PFAS thing and it's, it's certainly something that I'm thinking about, but I'm not sure if I have the perspective on the political side that, that you do. I love uh, I love the term greenery. I'm going to steal that and use that. The greenery movement is just not uh, it's just not living up to its promise. Um, I have lots of thoughts about this, and this is one of the few moments where I'll let myself get on a soapbox, but I'll try not to be too pedantic about it. Um, before you and I even knew each other, when I first launched um, Perch at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the things we launched Perch with was a forecast of the 2020s and some of the major trends that I thought were going to shape geopolitics in the 2020s. And I actually had to go back and reread that piece recently because I was speaking at a conference earlier this week. The theme was the next five years. So when you're when you're speaking about the next five years, like it's still within the framework of that piece that I wrote gosh, almost three years ago now. And one of the chapters of that piece is the rise of climate politics. And not about how we're going to have the energy transition quite yet or that the economy is going to become more green, but that climate politics itself is going to become a political force and a political ideology. And in the same way we used to talk about communism and liberalism, you know, now we're going to have greenism and populism and all these other sorts of environmentalism. And the 
I feel weird even talking about these things because I'm not technically a member of the Sierra Club, but I'll let some biases show. Like if I, I should be a member of the Sierra as of the Sierra Club. I'm as green as they come. I want to save the environment. I think it's completely ridiculous how we are destroying the planet. And I get real angry when anybody comes on, oh, climate change. Like, yes, it's all real. And I hate that we're destroying the planet and it makes me feel terrible. That said, I do not understand the bait and switch that has happened with environmental politics in general, because none of the things we actually need to do to have not just a greener economy, but one that is more sustainable, one that is more secure, one that is more efficient, like all those things sort of go together in tandem. If you really want to change like the fundamental systems that power all of our economy, first of all, we have to do that in sort of a really careful way. And we can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. And Germany is a great example. The Greens want to be the leader of the energy transition in Germany, and yet they're shutting down nuclear power plants and burning more coal because they have to give power to the German economic system because of some demented sense that nuclear power plants are not safe or not renewable or any of these other things. Um, look who the most famous person, arguably, in America is, aside from Donald Trump. It's Elon Musk, this like prophet of electrification. Um, I was shocked when I, I was at the New Orleans airport earlier this week. I put I, I parked my car in the, in the long-term parking lot because I was only going to be away for two days. They have entire rows that are just for charging EVs. None of the, the, the charging power, charging capacity that is charging all of those stupid Teslas in the New Orleans parking garage, airport parking garage, is coming from green energy. It's all coming from natural gas or coal or you know, petrol, I mean, from other hydrocarbons. And we somehow think that, you know, EVs, even though they're made with slave labor to get the cobalt from the DRC and like all these other terrible mining processes that, as Tomas has been on this podcast before and talked about how backwards it is, and somehow that's what passes for green. Um, just, I mean, keeping it within Europe, like um, Ursula von der Leyen this week had this big speech about how she wanted to launch anti-subsidy investigations into Chinese electric vehicles because Europe doesn't want to be left behind and have China be the electric vehicle leader leading sort of the global green movement and Europe falling behind. Who cares? Let them have the electric vehicle move. It's not going to do anything for you, especially if you don't change the grid and figure out that you're still importing lots of LNG and natural gas from Russia and everything else. So I'm I'm pontificating a little bit, but yes, I think you're exactly right. We've had these strange political coalitions latch on to ideas about what it means to be green, but if you're somebody who cares about the environment and who also wants there to be safe and clean and efficient and secure energy, it's really, really hard to have that conversation. I'll give you one more tangible example. I can't say where I was when I was doing this, but I was presenting to an audience um, and there was a fairly important person in that audience and they were very clearly like conservative and very skeptical on sort of green energy and they asked me like hey like you know we, we i talked about energy transition in the context of my slides and and the, they asked me like well i don't understand like like i don't this green stuff doesn't make sense to me everything that they're doing that is green is just going to make things more expensive and it's actually going to be even less pollutive than before and i said to that person if it was you and me sitting down at the table figuring out what the best policy would be i'm sure we could find some common ground but what what passes for sort of green politics right now doesn't really do that. So I don't know, I'm, I'm ranting there in general, so it's hard for me to, to be objective because of how, how angry I am about that. But to go back to sort of the objective, Jacob, who in 2020 is writing about the 2020s in general and thinking about the future, um, yes, this has become a major issue. Like climate is now something that uh, people care about and it creates sort of political coalitions and ideological affinities that maybe it didn't even 10 or 15 years ago. And I don't really know what we do about that because the actual issue, like how do we get clean, efficient, safe, secure energy? Like nobody's actually talking about that. Like that's, it's probably actually easier to do that than people realize. I wonder if part of it is that um, it's just very easy to speak in ideals and a lot of it is sort of emotional posturing and signaling values about who you are and and who you want to be perceived to be but when you really get to where the rubber hits the road um i don't think most people want to talk about the very difficult costs that must be incurred in order to do what we want to do in many of these cases like the pfas thing we talked about and Tomas and I, basically the gist of our, of our report is here's, you know, eight different major areas where this is going to be a massive problem and we're going to incur major costs and companies are going to have a huge headache dealing with this. But another thing came up in my reading, which I think is an interesting example and one that's a little more close to home for most people, right? 
So I was reading a, uh, a Wall Street research piece over the weekend, and I won't say which firm put it out because I don't want to trash them. And it's not their fault. It's indicative of everything. Now, these are professional forecasters. These, are, these people are paid good money to tell you what's going to happen, not what they want to happen. Mm-hmm. Right? And if you read the numbers on, like you talked about electric vehicles, the numbers on the chargers... It's just shocking. And it, and it's impossible to square what the current status is versus what people are saying is going to be the situation within a, a not too far away time frame. So just to give some concrete examples around that, right now, there are about 150,000 EV chargers in the US. And over the last year, we added 33,000 new chargers, right? This, that's today, mid 2023. This Wall Street bank is saying that we're going to go from 150,000 today, of which we're adding 33,000 with the government stimulus, which the with the infrastructure bill, with every you know tailwind behind this, that we're going to go by 2030. There's going to be 33 million chargers. That's their forecast. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have my calculator. That's that's a lot of growth. That's a pretty high compounded rate of growth. Let's just say that. So, okay, the numbers themselves are just stark. Like you can't, if you add up 33,000 per year, you can add up, you know, over seven years. You don't get to 33 million, right? So what is like, okay, well, maybe th- this is just the early, the thin part of the wedge, right? Well, none of the numbers seem to support that. So this was very interesting and and most people probably don't know this. So they have data on how the chargers are being used. So this data is being collected. So one of the problems is that there's a heavy skew within the use of chargers. So the the top 20% of chargers account for 50% of all the charging, which means that a very small percentage of the chargers actually get used. And most of them are sitting there and not being used very much at all, which is a big problem, especially because, hey, we're supposed to be at the start of the adoption curve. These things, the demand for these things should be very high. Okay. So um, the, so the utilization rate on all of the chargers is very low. It's like in the teens percent. Um, And then, you know, that's highly skewed within that. And then each charger installation so far now keep in mind these are in the best areas and they're being done by the people you know these this isn't in rural north dakota where you were this is in like you know mountain view california where these things are going in where you have experienced installation crews you know you have density where you can install them right now every charger on average for the DCFC chargers is $170,000 to install. Mm -hmm. So like you don't need a master's degree in finance to know that if they're not getting used, if they cost $170,000 to install, never mind, that's like leaving aside the grid issues of providing enough electricity in the right places, which our public utilities are not very good at, frankly. That's not like moving fast is not what they're known for leaving all that aside just looking at the actual installation like the economic returns on this are deeply negative already so why are we going to build 33 million of these the government is already throwing a ton of money in this direction and and like i say that to ask like this is this is the wall street forecast and this is when people picture ev penetration like the amount of rigor that gets applied to some of these bottlenecks is just not, it's just not there. And I, I, I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, but unless we really think about these issues, they're, they're just not going to get solved. Like we'll be here in 2027. We'll be like, Hey, we got 400,000 chargers. Like, yeah, well that's 2% of what we hoped we would be able to achieve. So, um, Anyway, that's my my bummer story about the chargers, but um, no, it I is do a bummer. Sense a theme. And, and it won't actually 
help the the end goal here like if the goal is to reduce emissions which i think is a worthwhile goal even if you even if you're very skeptical about everything else like you know if you can if you can maintain energy security and keep energy um cheap why not make it make fewer emissions like nobody's saying that it's good to have all the co2 in the environment i don't think so if, if i can assure you that we're going to make it um it's going to be the same price or cheaper, and it's going to be more secure, than, and we can have fewer emissions. Great. And that's very easy. Why not just switch away? You know, we still burn a lot of coal in the United States for power. When natural gas prices spiked last year because of the Russia-Ukraine war and the European energy crisis and everything like that, we actually had a big uptick in coal usage because when natural gas becomes too expensive, a lot of times we switch to coal. If you wanted to really, like... Uh, uh, make a dent in emissions, just get rid of coal. Apologies to the West Virginia coal miners, all three of you that are still listening to the podcast. Like, let's like let's just go full on natural gas. But then you look at like, so California's ripping out natural gas stoves because natural gas is a hydrocarbon and it's not good. So it's, yeah, like you said, the only way that this can happen is it's a bait and switch at a political level. And probably, like the depressing thing is probably those stations, those charging stations will get built. But like to to what end and to what goal? I don't I don't really know. But there's a there's also a separate thing here to talk about, which points towards our second topic. I don't know if you want to talk about it now because we do need to still talk a little bit about the ECB in Germany and Europe. But the other thing is about the fact that all these electric cars, especially if, as they get more advanced and you have new models and things like that, like um, they need uh, computer chips inside of them to make them all work. And the bottlenecks in the semiconductor supply chains as a result of the U.S.-China trade war, uh, it's not just a problem for China because uh, Intel's promises aside and TSMC's promises aside from what they want to build in the United States, like we don't make the cutting-edge chips here in the United States. The reason that I was on this podcast for 12 months lamenting the fact that I couldn't get a freezer replaced is because they didn't have the chips to put in the freezer, and so I was waiting for 12 months. So imagine if we're going to sell the number of electric vehicles that have to go with all those charging stations, like where are those chips going to come? from where are all the chips that are going to come from to power automation and internet of things and artificial intelligence and all these great things that we're supposed to be doing we're not making them here so we'll have charging stations for <laughs> for cars that aren't actually making the environment cleaner and we might not even have the cars in the first place because we won't have the chips we're very optimistic today Rob. <laughs> <laughs> well i think what we're seeing in in action is the fact that there's no price signal like not to be mr economist over here but ultimately what we're talking about is we're trying to get rid of these older forms of energy and older forms of technology and replace them with new ones because of environmental and carbon reasons for which there is no market price. And that's why we got into this mess in the first place, because it was just cheaper to do it the other way. But at the same time, without the market price, like, and yeah, I understand there's cap and trade and tradable credits and stuff like that, but it's on a very small scale. And you know of, of questionable uh, uh, you know function. Um, you can indulge these sort of nice sounding forecasts and fantasies without being without having you know your face held to it nearly as easily. I guess is what I would say. But on on the more optimistic note, like you did mention the ECB in Germany, and I want to pivot from talking about inevitable bottlenecks to maybe illusory bottlenecks because you know as you mentioned uh, German industrial production has been terrible it's been really you know falling off for uh, 12 months or more and now the services economy even in the more Mediterranean uh, nations that had benefited from a tourism boom um, Italy uh, France Spain the service sectors and, and those nations is starting to really slow more than people expected as well. So you have this big slowdown. And at the same time, the ECB is keeping rates high, like in the US, you know, not at the same, you know, nominal absolute level, but they're saying similar things. And I think this is really interesting because um, for those who have a little extra time and are interested in these topics, it's worth reading uh, Isabel Schnabel's uh, speech from the ECB. I think she gave it at Jackson Hole because mm -hmm. she went through like a lot of her thinking about why essentially she thinks ECB rates are going to have to remain high. And a lot of this is about the energy transition and these perceived bottlenecks. Um, and I think this is interesting because 
they're looking at European inflation and they're looking at the weakness in the German industrial economy, for example, and they're saying, this is not a demand problem, this is a supply problem. German industrial companies are suffering because energy is too expensive, because costs are too expensive. There's a structural cost problem and therefore supply is shrinking and that's inflationary, it's not deflationary. And that's sort of become, I think, um, in many ways, the consensus. Uh, the Economist did a big cover piece on Germany and all its ills. And I know we've gotten some questions, including from clients, about German deindustrialization and what do we think. And um, I guess the differentiated view I would put out there, and I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is maybe they're mistaking a demand problem for a supply problem. Um, because we've we've talked about sort of the energy issues in Germany and, and how we think they're being overblown in the past. And I know you've been doing some updated uh, work around that more recently. But the fact is that um, German industrial growth started to really roll over right as China was locked down. Like it was sort of a perfect storm. China was locked down. And then right as China started to open up, the U.S. inventory cycles really rolled over. So a lot of these Chinese factories, they had a brief little spurt, but they didn't get off the mat. And now they've slowed down again. And it's been a real rough demand situation for, you know, from the perspective of a German exporter. Um, so I just wonder if you do see a bottoming in some of these end markets, particularly China, um, and I think you're seeing some early signs that the U.S. inventory cycle might be starting to turn, which is very good for Chinese manufacturers who then turn around and buy German capital goods. I wonder if they're taking this demand problem and, and using the same kind of, you know, greeny assumptions and saying, oh, well, they're getting squeezed because we're making this energy transition, but it's really not that. In which case if German growth comes back, that might not even, that might even, you know, uh, if it causes the ECB to change their assumptions about su the supply bottlenecks and issues, you might even see uh, nominal interest rates in, the, in Europe go down uh, and not up, which is the opposite of what you'd see if, you know, in a typical growth rebound. I don't know if I'm explaining that well, but. No, you are. There's a lot to pick apart there. Um, the first is just that it's a reminder that, you know, we talk about multipolarity, we talk about deglobalization, reshoring, all, all these things are happening. It's still early innings of the ball game. Like the scenario that you just described just goes to show you how globalized the economy still is. Um, and really how, you know, I, I've been talking for a couple of weeks about how, well, look at look at inflation in sort of developing parts of the world. Look at Nigeria, look at India, like the pri even Brazil, like consumer prices are going up again. Um, the Biden White House was trying to do a victory lap on, hey, we've beaten inflation, everything is fine. But you started getting these little hints that around the world things weren't going so well and that energy prices might go up. And that's because to the extent that we're still dealing with all this geopolitical competition, the legacy of globalization, it's not like you're going to snap your fingers and suddenly we're not going to be in a globalized economy. So these things are still linked. And I think that's a good reminder of that. The second thing is, is um, you know, the economist was the one that called Germany the sick man of the euro, what, 98, 99? And if you had listened to the economist, you would have, you know, missed the third German economic miracle. That doesn't mean that they're wrong this time. Like, just because they were wrong then doesn't mean that they're wrong now. But just to say, like, the economist has a history of underestimating Germany. And one of my great geopolitical rules, brilliant as I am, is never underestimate the Germans. I'm not going to underestimate the Germans, and I would encourage the listeners not to underestimate the Germans as well. And, I mean, I think you're sort of right. I, I mean, they have a couple different issues here. The energy issue is real for them. So even last year when we were um, combating some of the hysteria about um, – the energy crisis for German companies, for companies that have supply chain exposure in the Czech Republic and Slovakia and Hungary, like these are places that were dependent on natural gas from Russian, from uh, from pipelines that were connected to Russia. So there's going to be a process of, um, of figuring out new energy supply, and that's going to be costly and it's going to be volatile. It's probably not going to be in one direction. And they had what the second warmest winter in recorded history over this earlier this year. Maybe we get the third warmest coming up. Maybe we get a snap back into something much colder, and maybe we're talking about much higher energy prices. So they are exposed on that level. 
The other thing, though, is that, like from a demand perspective, is you've got a couple things that work there. Like, yes, China's economy hasn't done as well. Plus, China wants Chinese companies to sell into the Chinese market. Germany was hoping that they were going to sell into the Chinese market, but China wasn't really down for that. So Germany's also had to retool that on the fly, and it lost Russia as a potential market or as a potential source of cheap labor, too, um, which is why when you start talking about the Russia-Ukraine war, there's lots of things happening with the Russia-Ukraine war, but in some ways, the need for Germany to open up new markets and have new sources of cheap labor. Um, I think you can feel in both Paris and Berlin the way that they're looking at the Ukrainian conflict a little bit differently. And I think they're thinking about Europe supporting Ukraine for the long haul in a way I don't think the United States will, precisely because they see some of the issues that you're talking about. And the answer, the answer to Europe's problems, or I guess to the structural setup of the European Union is you have to expand. You have to keep out expanding more. You have to find new markets. You have to make more goods for more people. And you're not going to get it in Europe because the demographics suck. So you got to go to China. And if you can't go to China, maybe you can pick up 40 million people in Ukraine and 10 million people in the Western Balkans. Maybe we can do something in the Middle East. And by the way, Sub-Saharan Africa, demographics growing there. So you start putting it together. Germany needs expansion. Um, and I think that's sort of the key takeaway for me, like, yes, they have challenges. Yes, they're real. It might take them a year or two to metabolize them. There's a reason that we're tactically short Germany right now. It's not looking so good in terms of how they're tackling the problems. But like at every single phase where Germany has faced problems like this post-World War II, they usually get their shit together and they figure out what new markets they're going to expand to or how they're going to continue to do things. And the last thing that I would do is underestimate you know, sort of the Germans' capacity to do that. The last thing I just say is this goes back to the domestic politics. This German government, probably not going to be able to do it. But the more this German government stumbles over itself and the more eye patches uh, are worn in Olaf Scholz's cabinet, the more you're probably going to get a counter reaction so that in the next election, maybe they'll elect a government that can govern without these sort of asinine coalitions that are disagreeing with each other and, can, and they can do the types of targeted policies that enabled the last three quote unquote miracles to take off. So that's how I would sort of put all that together. It's it's not an unambiguously positive story. And I think there's gonna be a lot of bumps in the road here over the next two to three years. But you know, the 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 idea that Germany is deindustrializing means you think that the Germans are just gonna wave the white flag and give up. And there's nothing in German history to suggest that that's a thing that's gonna happen, that Germany's just gonna go off the cliff and not come back. They're probably gonna figure it out when their back is against the wall. <clears throat> I guess I have two thoughts to follow up on that. Um, the first would be, you know, we talked about sort of in the thick of the, um, I think it was fall of 2022, um, when the Financial Times was all, you know, German energy crisis, deindustrialization, it's, 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 it's happening, it's terrible, et cetera. And uh, at that time, I pointed out, which I think is still very valid, you know, because one of the most vocal companies complaining about this was BASF. And it just happened. They they were saying if you dug into what they actually did versus what they said, because BASF was being interviewed for all these articles in the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal, and what they were saying was Germany is just not competitive. We can't build. We can't make chemicals in Germany anymore. Like our production facilities, we're going to have to close them. We're going to fire people in Germany. And what they have been doing is they're building a big facility in China, by the way, um, which I think is is interesting. And and I suspect they're trying to use, you know, this as a fig leaf for building that and say, well, what, you know, we told you it's the politician's fault for screwing this all up. Um, but if you look at what they actually did at the time, the layoffs that they made were not in the production facilities. They weren't firing you know, um, people working at these big chemical plants, they were firing IT people and services people and, you know, knowledge workers sitting behind a desk. So I think a lot of the rhetoric doesn't match the actions if you really dig into them in many cases. The other thing that I would point out on that sort of similar note is like, you always have to think about what the, in the incentives are of people who are saying things in public. And again, this is another case of like, what does the media say? What is the narrative versus what do the numbers say? What are people actually doing? You know, what is the forecast versus what's actually happening? And in this case, the German export sector has a huge incentive to say that green policies are a disaster because they don't want 
supply restrictions. They don't want to incur these costs. They probably do have legitimate fears that this is going to be a pain in the ass and expensive and reduce their competitiveness over the long term. So to say like, oh, it's already killing us. So, you know, like, of course they're going to say that. So I don't think you can listen to what people say and make any conclusions about what's happening in Europe. You have to look at what they do. Um, the other sort of broader topic that I think is worth getting into is, so we're about to publish a piece um, on Poland for clients, uh, probably right after we record this later today. So I don't want to you know, give away too much of what we say in there, but I think it's interesting, this notion of industrial capacity moving to areas like Poland. And Poland, as you point out in the piece, is one of the only large countries that is increasing its industrial capacity in the West um, and its manufacturing capacity, which is a pretty striking um, statistic. And, and it's kind of interesting when you think about EU enlargement. And one comparison I would give, and maybe this is a stretch, is if you look at the U.S. after the Civil War, right? A big part of why we fought the Civil War, yes, it was about slavery, of course, but in many ways it was because fundamentally the South wanted to have a free trading agricultural-based society that was tied to England at the hip and would export into there. And, and the North did not want that. We wanted to have a high tariff barrier mercantilist society that would increase manufacturing production capacity that would climb up the value chains that would compete with England and England's dominance. And it's sort of the, um, you know, the Hamiltonian view versus, versus the Jeffersonian view. But the great irony is like, okay, once we fought the civil war and we kept the South in the union, we then proceeded to spend the next hundred years moving all of our manufacturing to the South. Yeah. <laughs> so, I wonder if Europe has a similar opportunity here to expand its own union and at some level, like they're not building new factories in France, I'll tell you that much. They're not, you know, in Germany, we can debate about that and we've talked about it, but what a great opportunity to expand manufacturing capacity in places like Poland or potentially in the future, a place like Ukraine. Um, uh, that's that's something I'm thinking about. I don't know what I think about it yet, but I'm toying with that comparison. No, and we're about to we're about to embark on some research on this, and you know we reserve the right to change our minds. Maybe we'll come back in two months and say, oh, that was that was really dumb, and we actually dug in like it gave a completely different picture. But um, I I was lucky enough when I was in Lisbon a couple of weeks ago to have dinner with a couple of podcast fans. Uh, cheers, you guys! Thanks so much for taking me out. And one of the things we talked about there, and I'll, I promise this, we'll get back to, to Germany and Ukraine in a second. It'll, it'll feel a little windy, but we'll get there. Um, they talked about how 20, 30 years ago, you could have bought like a basement apartment in Lisbon for 20,000 euro, 30,000 euro. I mean, just completely dilapidated. Portugal was, it was the pigs, right? And they were, they were maybe one of the, the real stalwarts of, you know, bad economy, drug addiction everywhere, all those sorts of things. Those same apartments I was walking around Lisbon, they go for 500,000 euros now. And the guys at dinner said, it was so obvious you know, but, but it wasn't obvious. Like they didn't buy the basement apartments, but somebody, it was so obvious to somebody that, Hey, this is Lisbon. This is on the coast. This is like a great part of Europe. Like one day there will be market for this 20,000 euro shitty, uh, shitty basement apartment to be sold for, for 500,000 euros. And I think that way about Ukraine today, everybody says it's impossible. There's problems with corruption. There's a Russia, Ukraine war, yada, yada, yada. But my hunch is that 10 years from now, uh, when townhomes in, in Kiev are going for 200,000 and 300,000 euros and when Ukraine has all these factories and is basically just going to repeat what happened in Eastern Europe when it joined, um, you know, when it got out from underneath the communist bloc and joined the European Union and all that happened. Like, I think 10 years from now, that will feel like the obvious thing that happened. And it's, it's hard to say that today just because of the mess that has to happen to get from point A to point B. But I, I do think if you're just stepping back and really trying to be just purely macro about it, like, yes, like Germany is going to work to integrate Ukraine into the EU. G Germany for centuries has been wanting to integrate Russia into its own various versions of empires and things like that. And it's just going to settle for the richest <laughs> part of Russia in some sense, which is Ukraine. 
Uh, we've got seven more minutes, Rob. Do you want to just, that's probably not enough to talk in depth about China, but maybe we can tease it and come back to it. Um, I think I, I think we talked about it a little bit and it, it has to do with, um, you know, some articles that have come out examining the technology behind these new Huawei smartphones and really showing that SMIC, which is basically China's version of Intel and some of these other Chinese semiconductor companies, um, all of the U.S. trade war and export restrictions and technology restrictions and everything else, uh, and all the concern that an authoritarian system like, like China can't produce tech innovation and things like that. Well, in that Huawei smartphone, it looks like they produced an awful lot of tech innovation. It looks like the, you know, Huawei took it on the chin for a couple of years. Um, and ironically, I think that the United States in some ways turned Huawei from a global tech company to a Chinese tech champion uh, by virtue of really killing its global prospects. But um, it looks like China showing you, or at least demonstrating a form of tech resilience and the ability to create indigenous technologies that are, if not at the cutting edge, like they'll do for China's goals, at least here in the short term. Yeah, I don't know if we can adequately cover this in seven minutes, now six minutes, um, but definitely setting the table. I think, I think it's worth talking about this both specifically to the semiconductor uh, context, um, but also in terms of how do you think as an investor about the next twenty years, if this is a multipolar environment. How do you think about catch-up growth versus, you know, um, growth at the technological frontier? And I think a lot of people think of China, you know, as as primarily a catch-up growth story in some ways. Um, but I think this really shows, and and historical examples abound, that it's almost impossible to to deny if there's a well-functioning system. If there's a, sim a system where the incentives are right and the institutions are not falling apart, if they're determined to learn how to do something, they're, they're probably going to figure it out. And the United States did this successfully, you know, going back to the Industrial Revolution. I mean, we had, we, uh, like, the, 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 the looms of that time were the EUV machines <laughs> of, you know, of today. They were super complicated, you know, these closely guarded secrets. And yeah, like we figured it out. It wasn't, you know, it's very difficult to keep that stuff under wraps. Um, so it's worth thinking about that. And I, I think, you know, we've sort of expressed this in the past, but this sort of confirms this theory that the notion that we're going to keep China in some kind of box when it comes to high-end semiconductors is, seems pretty fanciful. So what do we, what are the implications? I think it's worth having a conversation about that. Not right now. No, I mean, we'll have a deeper one, but I, I think it's also, it's the inverse also of just as it's also unrealistic for China to think that its dominance and say rare earths is going to keep the United States or U.S. companies back. And I think that's usually the frame that especially Western investors think of. They think of, oh, well, China has these advantages and commodities and they might use it against the United States and the West, but they'll be able to make it work. The, the ironic thing is when China has tried to use that leverage, well, it just encourages more growth and development and sort of things in, in, in that sector in the United States and in countries like Japan. The flip side is also true. By, by trying to restrict technology for China, you've actually just created the need for China to become more self-sufficient. And I guess just sort of the 30,000 foot view to say about this before we get out of here is that this is why multipolar worlds um, are so filled with opportunity. It's not just a risk story. It's not just a cover your eyes and oh my God, terrible things are happening in the world because competition breeds innovation. And a year ago, probably the people that were doing things in China, they, they might have thrown up their hands and said, no, none of it's possible, but they have figured something out here to allow them to get a phone that has similar performance and is gonna let Huawei sort of come back here from the dead. And that's gonna be true throughout the world. You're gonna get countries all over the world out of necessity, throwing money and energy at innovating within their own economies. And that's that's really what sort of a multipolar world is all about. Because in a globalization world, it's all just, you know, okay, Taiwan's going to be really good at the fabs and South Korea's going to be really good at the memory and China's going to be good at the packaging. We're going to design them in the US and everybody's going to get them. We're moving away from that world and that's going to, it's going to create lots of disruptions. But to your point, it's also going to create opportunities to ride, I think, from an investor point of view. It's going to be hard, I think, for Western investors to ride it in China because, 
Um, you know, we started this podcast talking about environmentalism and green politics. China is just as ideological an issue for the West. Um, at, at some thing, at some point, I think it doesn't matter for Western investors that this is happening in China. They just won't invest. Um, but I think there are there are ways to think about that and stories in other countries that we're going to have to pay close attention to, for which this is a good sort of platonic ideal. And and not just stories at the technological edge, just to reinforce that, because everyone talks about semiconductors, you know, okay, it's very important. Most of the growth, most of the real growth, just an absolute sheer magnitude over the next 20 years is not going to be semiconductors and three nanometer chips. It's going to be poorer countries figuring out how to do basic stuff better. And especially in a multipolar world where all of a sudden it's not so easy to get your steel from that supplier that maybe you once did or your tires or basic things like that. That is a huge incentive for those countries that can figure out the ingredients, the institutional ingredients for exceptional growth stories. Um, and the, the, the example that I always love is if you read Alice Amston's book, Asia's Next Giant, which she wrote in the 1980s, she goes into great detail about how South Korea, which at the time was the most piss poor little fishing village, you know, ass end of nowhere place in the 1950s and 60s, how South Korea basically got the ingredients right. And they, like today, POSCO is one of the biggest steel makers in the world. They're the steel giant. Well, how did POSCO start? They basically put you know, 10 guys in a room and said, uh, go figure out how to make a steel plant. And they said, okay, well, and they went to the Europe and the United States with their notebooks and, and they figured it out. Um, you're going to see a lot more of those stories in Indonesia in you know, places that you wouldn't expect them. Um, I think as, and especially those that are maybe straddling two different lines or, um, will find it more difficult to import uh, everything that they need as sort of globalization recedes over time. We'll pick it up there next week. Listeners, if I said anything that sounds completely wrong or you completely disagree with, just remember I'm delirious on cold medication. I, I take no responsibility for anything. In fact, I just blacked out for the last 45 minutes. I don't even know what happened. See you later, Rob. See ya. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.